Hey, welcome back, everybody. It's time once again for another episode of Living Hope, a weekly journey designed to provide hope, inspiration, and education for those living with pancreatic cancer, sharing the real-life stories of those really affected by this deadly disease and how they deal with it on a daily basis. With a woman, well, she's been dealing with it for a day or two here. I'll bring in uh, Roberta Holman here. Thank you, Paul. It's been many days. I should actually count down the, how many days are in 20 years, right? When is, when is your anniversary? Is it in April? April 1st, April Fool's Day. That's You were fooled on April Fool's Day. That's right, and saying. I fooled them too, didn't I? <laughs> so 21 on April 1st. Yeah, I'll be 21 again. How about that? Fantastic. How many people can she, say they do 21 twice, right? And does she know, like everybody else knows on this show, that on April, the first week of April, you to celebrate, you're going to jump out of an airplane? Yep, on April 8th, we're taking another leap of faith. Wow. <laughs> How many is this? It'll be my 10th jump. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, and is Vic joining you? We're not sure yet. We have to kind of wait and see because he got a new entrance policy and it tells him he can't. So ah, I'll tell him he can't. If, he, if the insurance does it, he can't. Yeah, don't now, do that he, it. now that he owns a business, it, it told him he can't jump. So I don't know. We'll see. We'll find out. Okay. <laughs> today, I'm very, very excited for a number of reasons, but especially to have Amy Reese with us today from Patient and Family Support Coordinator with the Hirschberg Foundation for Pancreatic Cancer Research. That's a mouthful. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. I'm really, really excited. Like I said, I've been working on you for a long time, so I'm glad <laughs> you, finally, you finally gave in or something. I, I don't know, but I really appreciate you being here. So could you just give us a little bit about what it is that you do with Hirschberg? I do. First of all, I get one-on-one -on -one with you today, so that's the plus. Oh, thank you. Every time we see each other at events, we don't get to sit down and have a conversation. Right, so, so quick. This is our conversation today. I am the Patient and Family Support Coordinator, as you said, for the Hirschberg Foundation, and so when I get calls or emails from people who have been newly diagnosed or families that are dealing with a diagnosis, and I share patient resources. So my job is to educate empower and help someone join our community so they don't feel alone. Do you do this for any reason? Do you have a connection personally with pancreatic cancer? I do. Uh, I have a familial history. Um, lost my mother to pancreatic cancer and her grandfa excuse me, her father and her mother. So it's my mom and my grandparents, my maternal grandparents to this disease. Well, I don't know why I didn't know that before. Um, I'm sorry, we, it's, we even have a more of a connection than I realized, because, you know, both we, losing many family members to it. Many family members, and when I heard your story, I, of course, related to it. It's, um, yeah, you know, when you the first person in your family is diagnosed, you, you don't know quite what that means. But when you start to have multiple members, then, then uh, as I've learned with this position, uh, I'm now a high-risk individual. But I say that I'm one of the lucky ones because I know to look for it. And we know with this disease, it comes out of the blue for the majority of people. So with early detection programs and high gear all over the country, um, I feel like those in your position or my position or our family members, we know, we know to get diagnosed, uh, excuse me, for diagnostics, whether it's endoscopic ultrasound or whether it's MRI and stay in touch with our gastroenterologist and just keep up to date with scans. Yeah, it's very important because I think like many of us, at least me, I didn't even think about pancreatic cancer. I didn't even know, you know, anything. I didn't think about it, what, pancre what the pancreas does or what it is until I heard Michael Landon, you know, talk about his diagnosis. And then sadly, you know, after his death, I really never thought about it again. You know, uh, until it hit my family and then my dad and then finding out, like you say, the family history. So um, knowing what your pancreas does, looking for the symptoms, it's early detection is really, really important. Hirschberg is doing something. I think this is their, I want to say their 17th it is. year for doing it. It is. Something that I look forward to going to every year. I sound, it sound kind of weird, but um, it's <laughs> not only connecting with other people, you know, uh, survivors, patients, caregivers, but the resources you offer. So could you tell us what it is that's happening and when it is happening? I can. So on Saturday, March 11th at the UCLA Luskin Conference Center, we'll be having our 17th annual symposium. And it's really for it's it's for the lay person it's for the patient who's newly diagnosed it's for the survivor who's been around for a while and comes back into the fold and shares their stories with 
with other people in the community. And we have a, a fantastic lineup of, of presenters uh, this year. And each year at the end of our symposium, we have uh, an evaluation form filled out. And so one of the questions is, what would you like to see next year? Or what topic would you like to um, have tackled? And so we take those very seriously. And this year, a lot of a lot of what's come up in the last year or two is now part of the this year's symposium. What are some of the items you're going to be tackling? What are some of the things that patients are your from the past have asked for? So one, our first speaker is Jenny Tran from the Sims Man UCLA Center for Integrative Oncology. And Sims Man is a nonprofit group that if you're a patient at UCLA, they're there for you to help guide you through a diagnosis. And that subject is turning down the volume on worry, managing cancer-related anxiety. Mm -hmm. And that's just for all of us to be able to manage anxiety, but in particular for anyone going through a diagnosis like that. So it's for the patient, it's for the caregiver, it's for the family, everyone, as you know, when one person is diagnosed in the family, it's it's really everybody that that is affected. So that's going to be a great conversation. And uh, Jenny has a one sheet on a worry workshop that people will be able to take home with them and refer to. So so that's something that that we feel is important to to present. I can go on. Yeah, no, please do. I, I want everybody to get an idea what's there. I mean, and, and I think what she's going to be talking about is really important because we always go through what we call scan anxiety. Yeah, <laughs> something that when it's time for those scans to come up, and I don't know why these darn people who schedule it decide to schedule it on a Thursday or a Friday, because then you have to go all weekend and wonder what the heck's going on until Monday or Tuesday. Right, right? it's always Thursday or Friday. <laughs> exactly, late so. in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know you're not going to get results right away. Yeah, and that's just consistent. I mean, if I talk to um, survivors, even you know five years out, getting a scan, it doesn't go away. That that anxiety, as you said. So it's just something that um, I think everyone can benefit from hearing this uh, Jenny talk about her workshop. And we have Shelby uh, talking about uh, sh- her last name is Yekazeko. Um, and I know I'm not pronouncing that correctly, but she's talking about dietary management post-diagnosis. And that means from day one. So Shelby works at uh, UCLA, and she's involved with the IPU, the Integrated Practice Unit at UCLA. So anytime a patient comes through and sees a doctor, they're connected with Jenny or someone on her team to learn about nutrition. And as you know from past lectures with Dr. Lee at UCLA, (laughs) It's important from day one. Very. And will she be able to touch on using the pancreatic enzymes? Is that something she touches on as well, or is that something different? Yeah, she'll be able to speak about enzymes when you use them, how you should use them. Of course, some people don't don't get the best direction on how to use them, and so therefore it's not helpful. Jen, uh, excuse me, Shelby will be able to speak to that. And her position is funded by the Hirschberg Foundation, and it's a great addition this year to uh, to the team to be able to direct people to Shelby if they haven't already met her. Yeah, because one of the biggest questions I always get in here from other patients and survivors is exactly the enzymes because you're just they just give them to you and say here you take these with meals. Well, it varies. How many do I take? What do, you know? So to have somebody to be able to maybe speak on that, I think is really Im- impressive, and I really, I appreciate that, and I know others will as well. And she'll be speaking to um, people not only diagnosed with. Uh, Edna carcinoma, which is which is more of the pancreatic cancer that people are familiar with, but also neuroendocrine. So there are two different kinds of cancer in the pancreas, and so she'll be able to she sees patients with both diagnoses. So it'll be helpful to anyone truly. Yeah, it is because a lot of times we kind of forget about the other one, and you know, just because maybe it's a little less aggressive, or sometimes the survival rate can be long, a little bit longer. So it's something. I mean, it's just as important as the other. You know, like you say, they're the two different kinds. So it's, and and often you're still having surgery in your pancreas, and so so therefore your digestive system is is challenged. <laughs> to put it blunt, <laughs> mildly, I've heard it put a little differently but yeah yes <laughs> the um, plumbing replumbing is really screwed up in there so um right so yeah definitely and who else can we look forward to seeing oh so from? so you may roberta have um a few years back listened to dr muthasami 
who's a gastroenterologist at UCLA. He runs the show over there. And he's talking about pancreatic cysts, diagnosing and treatment in 2023 because it changes. So um, he's last spoke with us on a patient and family webinar in 2021, but we're two years two <laughs> years from that. And so he's also on a particular board where they make decisions about how aggressive or non-aggressive we should be when we find pancreatic cysts. So at some point he's talked about in the past, anytime you go in and look at someone's pancreas, there's potential for finding a benign cyst. The question is, if something is precancerous, and in particular, if there's a family history, what do we do? How do we treat that? And what's the sur- particular surveillance for each patient? And so Dr. Muthasami is really going to be able to, to give us the latest information on how that's treated. Well, good, because, again, all the information you guys give, it, it's always amazing. And I, I just, you know, learn so much. You think by all this time... 20 years, I should know what everything, right? But I, everything is changing, and you guys always such a it's such a great experience to go to the symposium and hear all these different things. So, yeah, and for people to, that are able to be there in person and walk up to the mic and ask questions, or at lunchtime, the doctors are happy to share more information because a lot of people, you know, we 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 have a 10 minute Q and A, but it's also nice when the doctors are around to to speak in more detail to patients in particular. But Dr. Muthasami, it's just there's always a question of how aggressive should we be with these cysts because you don't want to perform surgery that's not necessary. And then the question, of course, is, well, if we're not aggressive enough. And so those guidelines change, and he'll he'll be able to share what the latest are. Because with more and more early detection, we're going to find on that endoscopic ultrasound or the MRI, they're going to see something. So now what? And that's the big question. Now what do we do with that? Exactly, and a lot of times, because it is a cyst, sometimes they don't want to do anything other than watch it, and I don't know, to me that's really scary, watching anything that has a potential to be pancreatic cancer just because of how fast it can grow and how fast it can change. Yeah, one of my siblings is, uh, we're watching a a side branch IPMN, it's called, Mm. and so every other year it's it's, um, measured and looked at, and then there's always a question of, well, do we do something or do we not, and so far, not. But uh, that's that's always in the back of my mind, it, you know, yeah, how is. aggressive we should or shouldn't be because this is my blood, this is my family. So it's very scary because we don't know too really how long can a tumor be lay there dormant and not you know not even know it's there. That's what they think may, might have happened with my dad just because mm-hmm. by the time it was diagnosed, it was so huge that they're wondering just how many years did it lay there doing absolutely nothing. So to keep in touch and. I still think early detection is one of the most important tools that that we can we can do. Um, Absolutely. W- yeah. What other guests? Who else is going to be oh. there? What else is going to be talking? Well, let about? me let me continue. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> I'll try to be quiet so you can. I, I really want people to hear what you're having because it's <laughs> really amazing. So, Dr. Huey is going to be speaking. His his topic is integrative East West medicine to optimize health and wellness. So these are some tools that. Um, you know, to really empower patients on what they can do for themselves. And so sometimes it's acupuncture, sometimes it's acupressure, other ways in which they can affect their health as they're going through treatment. And so Dr. Huey spoke years ago, prior to me being involved with the foundation on this subject. And so to have him come back, he started the um, East-West Medicine uh, Division at UCLA, and he's the king over there. So we're (laughs) excited to have him come and speak about what else we can do as a community for ourselves to make a difference, other, other ways in which we can help. Yeah, I think it's important because I, I, and I don't know if it's a correlation or a relation or not, but in my mind it is, is, you know, I've done chemo for a number of years, but once I added the holistic approach or different mm. methods, that kind of changed. I mean, my last chemo was in December of 2018, and I started asking, uh, adding holistic medicine around the summertime. So um, to have gone for years just doing chemo, and then when I added these things like acupuncture, acupuncture meditation, yoga, uh, the herbs, the different things, things changed. And I actually have somebody coming in talk, who will be talking about energy healing Mm -hmm. i just did a session and it was amazing so i can't wait to have her come in and talk about that but is that something too he can kind of talk about those things as adding maybe changes here absolutely he's the one that will be able to 
um, talk not just from a Western medicine, but Eastern perspective as well. So he definitely will be able to talk about that. And I'll talk later about someone on our panel who will also be speaking about that. Will he be able to address a little bit about the use of cannabis? Is that something he's familiar with, or is that different? I think that's a question to ask him. Um, We've had someone before talk about um, cannabis um, from, from the UCLA department. At the time, they were really working hard to to get to to conduct clinical trials so they could have more information so patients would speak anecdotally about how cannabis helped them with anxiety depression um, and getting a good night's sleep but really the doctors have to be able to turn to clinical trials and research in order to advance in this field so certainly people talk about how how it helps them um, it'll be interesting to, I would like you to ask him that question. <laughs> How can cannabis or CBD or CBN, any of these properties of the plant, help the cancer patient? Yeah, and to be honest, I've used both and all probably. I mean, mm-hmm. the lotion helps with neuropathy a little bit. And mm. you know, if they want to get a clinical trial, I'll be the first on the list to volunteer. <laughs> Good to know. Good to <laughs> so know. So if that ever comes up. So yeah, but I, I, I will definitely ask because it is something I hear a lot. And it did. It helped with my nausea. It really did. And so there's, I, you know, it's something that I really believe in. I just want to give that opportunity to others as well if they can. I think that's a presentation for next year symposium, because <laughs> because we've done we did it a few years prior, and so we have a patient and family webinar on our website about cannabis, and we also have a I think in uh, 2018 Dr. Jeffrey Chang who was at UCLA at the time spoke about it. So we have two two presentations to be able to look at, but it'd be nice to get an updated version. Of where are we in 2024, maybe? Right, I think so, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Anyone else coming that we can? Well, in fact, there is. <laughs> um, Dr. Brand, who's also been, on, been at our symposium before, he's coming from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and he's gonna be speaking on a subject that I know is gonna be important to a lot of patients and families, and that's should I participate in a clinical trial? I can't tell you how many phone calls I get about people wanting direction about a clinical trial and my surprise in the fact that they're not, their oncologists are not directing them either initially to choices on a clinical trial versus standard of care treatment or uh, when they finish standard of care what may be coming down the pike that they can take advantage of. Um, so there are all kinds of Uh, clinicaltrials.gov and other places to go for clinical trial information but I but Dr. Brand is really going to try to steer the patient and family towards understanding what a clinical trial is um, should I participate and if I'd like to participate what are the steps I can take to do that so yeah I think there's a lot of unfortunately misconceptions about clinical trials as well. I always run into them, and you know people always tell me, well, I'm afraid I'm going to get the placebo. Well, I try to explain to them you won't get a placebo. you'll at least get the standard of care and maybe the new drug is you know something you don't know, but it, you will never get the the sugar pill or the placebo. And others are always saying, well, it's a last ditch effort when you know you try to explain to them that should be maybe the first thing you that's look at right. because that's the only way we are going to get our treatments is through clinical trials. Unfortunately, you have to do this before the FDA will approve it. So it's very, very important. So anything we can do to kind of get that moving, mm-hmm. I think, would be very helpful as far as you know survival rate. Yeah, I mean, it's just education. It comes down to education for. I mean, not only our community on knowing to ask their oncologist, you know, what else is potentially out there? What, you know, is there anything else going on within the university I'm at or out in the world? How they might look themselves if they feel like they're not getting those answers from from their team themselves, which I, I would like to think they are. But if they're not, you know, ways in which they can approach this. So Dr. Brand, you know, he's flying from Pittsburgh. Oh, wow. And he'll uh, come spend some time with us. He'll be there the whole day. So. Oh, good. Because yeah, it is. It's really hard. A lot of doctors don't. You ask them about a clinical trial. They either don't know. And maybe because they're just too involved with what they're doing. They don't have time to research it. Mm -hmm. But I would think they would at least have somebody that they could refer you to. Well, here's where you go to find out about clinical trials. So hopefully he can answer some of those questions. And that'd be an awesome way to... Yeah, and he's he's just a great guy. His um, 
He's involved uh, with the foundation and other other areas. Our LA Cancer Challenge that we have each year. He's involved with the team. His his sister's involved as well, and mm-hmm. Debbie. So. Uh, so they're definitely friends of the foundation, and we're so appreciative of him uh, flying out and sharing this information with us and spending the day. Yeah, it's really that's really great. And I do want to ask because I know um, you can do this in person, but you can also, if you're not able to come for whatever reason, you're out of the area or just not feeling like you can do that. Can they do? Is there a virtual they can attend as well? There is. When you go on our website, pancreatic.org, and click on the 17th annual symposium, you'll be able to see the the full program that I'm sharing with you right now. And also, you can sign up for in-person or virtual. So, And is there a cost to attend the symposium? No charge. No charge for anybody? No charge for anybody. That's we awesome. are, we are, it's a beautiful conference center and lunch is served. And we welcome everybody who, who wants to come and learn and share uh, information. So no, no cost, it's, we have wonderful sponsors like Living Hope. Thank you. <laughs> a big important sponsor to the Hirschberg Foundation and through that generosity uh, and other other families that that give and UCLA Surgery and Novacure were able to put the event on at no charge. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just had a chemo brain, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I can share. Please do, fill me in here. <laughs> and I'd like to take over and continue. <laughs> Please um, do. In two years, I've never seen her speechless. You left her speechless here. She didn't know what, she didn't know what to say after that. Okay. I don't know where I was going after that. It I, totally left me. Please. Well, because because I'm supposed to keep going. Okay. <laughs> okay, Roberta. Um, palliative care, it's not hospice, is the, the name of... Uh, uh, Dr. Sachs's presentation. This is hugely important, like clinical trials, like integrative medicine, like nutrition, like everything else I've talked about. But palliative care is also um, not always understood. It's for symptom management. And really, a palliative care doctor should be considered to be on your team so that any symptoms that come up in the course of treatment uh, can be dealt with. And so it's not hospice, it is not end of life issues, it is just managing symptoms while, while you're in treatment. And Dr. Sachs will, will come and share that information with us, so. Well, I'm glad because a lot of people, they do, they confuse the two. They think that palliative care is just the next step to hospice, and it's not, I've known many, I mean, I've used palliative care and I'm still here. So, I mean, it's something that it does, it helps manage maybe the pain or diet or whatever you happen to be going through. So, and I've met other survivors who use it as well. So it is something very, very important. So I'm glad he's gonna be able to come and speak on that. And At UCLA, the Aggie Hirschberg Center for Pancreatic Diseases, uh, they do have the integrated practice unit. You go on clinic on Tuesdays. uh, In clinic, uh, there's a surgeon, a gastroenterologist, an oncologist, a genetic counselor, a lot of people looking at someone's medical information and charts and then coming out and sharing what they think the best course of treatment is. Well during that time you get to meet with the dietitian and you and a medical center where that's not being offered it's important to ask it's important to ask about nutritionist dietitian it's important to ask about palliative care clinical trials all of these things are are to empower the the patient and family as to what to do after diagnosis well i want to thank you for coming and joining us today and sorry about that little What happened, like, Roberta? The question, and I, now I, I remember the question now. <laughs> but um, I do want to thank you for you know coming and, and sharing this because I think I think it really really is important for anybody who can to attend it, whether it's in person, virtually, and we'll give you the contact info again in just a few minutes. But at the end of each show, we dedicate the show. And today, I actually want to dedicate it to, to you, to Aggie, mm. to Lisa, to all those that are putting this thing together, all those guests that are coming, the ones flying in and just mm-hmm. traveling, because it takes a lot of time. And I just really want to thank them for doing this. And thank you all. And today's show is dedicated to all you putting this symposium oh my together. Gosh. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Thank you for letting me share the information. The only group I didn't get a chance to talk to was our panel discussion, uh, perspectives from uh, survivors and caregivers 
caregivers. So that's going to be really wonderful to have two survivors and two caregivers showing at the end, sharing at the end of the day about their journey and tips and advice. And that's always very important. So I look forward to that as well. And you've been on that panel before. Yes, I have. And so has Vic. So and thank you. So has Vic. <laughs> this has been really wonderful. Thank you. I hope I hope everyone can show up either in person or virtually. And uh, the presentations will be on our website uh, a few weeks after the event as well. And give us the thank date you. and location again and how they find it. It's Saturday, March 11th at the UCLA Luskin Conference Center, and registration is required, and it's uh, there's no charge, and it's on our website, pancreatic.org. Okay. So hurry and register before it fills up. There right? you go. <laughs> Well, there you have it, one more resource to tap into, a real live event with real people there to answer your questions and tell you about a whole bunch of questions on your mind, or something you can attend virtually as well. If you want to know more about any of this, please contact Patient and Family Support Coordinator Amy Reese at amy at pancreatic.org, that's easy to remember, pancreatic.org, or you can call her at 310-473-5121, it's 310-473-5121. 473-5121. For me, thanks for joining us and uh, hope to see you there at the upcoming symposium as we continue to spread inspiration, hope, ideas, and inspiration like this to this weekly series we call Living Hope.